Hi, I'm Ian, and welcome to Ghosts and Bears, the podcast where we tell you the actual ghost story with the actual history in the actual place. This episode, we are off to Port Alice, British Columbia, where we'll learn about the ghosts of the old mill, who they are, why they're there, and perhaps we'll even discover some ghosts that are yet to be revealed. All coming up on Ghosts and Bears. Welcome back to episode three. We are, of course, very glad to have you with us. And uh, we are looking at Port Alice this time. Um, Port Alice is, as I may have mentioned, a place that's close to my heart and Jason's as well. Uh, we own a small place up there uh, that we use as a getaway and we also rent out as an Airbnb. And um, it's just really different. Um, Port Alice basically is only in existence because of the mill. Uh, there was a, a, a mill built there, a pulp and paper mill by the Whalen brothers. And they named the place after their mom, Alice, which is very sweet. Um, they began building the mill in 1917. And the first pulp was produced in 1918. And it just kind of ran from there. Uh, it's quite a ways up uh, Neurotsis Inlet um, through the inside passage. And it's uh, the far north of Vancouver Island, and they were really not really sure uh, how it was going to go. And over the years, it went up and down a lot. Um, the mill would open, and it would close, and it would open, and it would close. And through it all, people just sort of stuck around and hoped for better times. Well, recently, it closed. Uh, 2016, it closed with a bit of a flourish. Uh, foreign investors pulled out and just abandoned it. And all of a sudden, this mill that had been in production for on and off for uh, a century was finally done. Um, the mill needed a lot of help if it was ever going to be anything again, and it just wasn't worth it. Um, some of the people who used to work in the mill said they never tore anything down. They just simply added on to it um, to the point where in the last few years that it was operational, pieces of the old structure would literally fall from the ceiling and you were lucky if uh, <laughs> you were able to dodge it. <laughs> so not so good. Before we jump too far down the Port Alice path though, I wanted to hearken back way back to episode two. Um, and I had talked about uh, the babies possibly buried in the garden uh, at Helmkin House. And keen listener Lauren uh, helped me out with that. She did a little bit of research and here's what she found. It's quoted, um, Soon after the Helmkins moved into their new log house in 1853, Cecilia gave birth to a baby boy, Douglas Claude, named after her father, before the doors had been hung, as Dr. Helmkin later recalled. And later he wrote, When he was about a month or two old, we found him dead in the bed one morning. The anguish felt at this time is indescribable. The poor little fellow was buried in the garden where the holly now grows, close by out the bedroom window. An oval of white daisies was planted around with a daisy cross in the center. In 1858, the Helmkin's third child, Margaret Jane, known as Daisy, died at 18 months, and she too was buried there. In 1865, when uh, Cecilia Helmkin died, she was buried in the old Quadra Street burying grounds, now known as Pioneer Square, beside the current day cathedral, and the babies were moved to her tomb. So there we go. We have the answer. There are no dead babies lying under the ground of Helmkin House to be tromped on by wayward tourists and apparently ill-informed ghost walk guides. Um, but they were moved with Cecilia and buried with her. So uh, at least we know. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that, Lauren. We very much appreciate that. And of course, any other information people have that you hear or whatever, um, we of course want to hear it. Again, you've had an experience. Uh, we want to know, so let us know. And now back up north to Port Alice. 
The uh, town of Port Alice was uh, pretty happy from everything I've heard. There was a large community there um, that was built around the mill. It was built right beside it. Uh, it kind of sprang up. The, um, the idea was that people could live and work there, and it was this beautiful place. However, keep in mind, up until the 1960s, there was no road in and out. If you wanted to get to Port Alice, it was either by boat or by float plane. There were no uh, other options. Um, time went on. The uh, town was also uh, partly involved in World War II. Uh, in fact, a plane went down carrying a lot of uh, four military personnel. It actually ended up crashing into the schoolyard uh, in Port Alice. And they believe that it's possible that what happened was the plane took off from Port Alice, got caught up in the um, off-gassing from the mill, which threw off its um, flight, you know, the aerodynamics and all those good things. And it ended up coming down and crashing. The pilot actually aimed for the, the field rather than hit any of the houses. Uh, three of them were killed instantly on impact. But the pilot, not realizing this, he managed to get out. But he went back so many times to try and pull other people out that he ended up dying that night as well. So it was it was pretty awful, pretty traumatic thing for this uh, tiny village to deal with. And then, uh, as I say, the future took hold. A road went through, uh, and it was around this time that the uh, first signs of, hmm, maybe breathing in pulp mill effluence isn't awesome for humans. Um, if you go into the graveyard, uh, which we did do, and there's some pictures there for our buy me a coffee listeners um there's pictures of the graveyard and you can really see that the graves start around 1917 1918 and then they kind of peter out uh in the mid to late 60s and that was because the mill decided they were going to move everybody from the uh mill beside the mill uh, because they were concerned about their health. This is what they told them. But what the real truth was, most likely, they wanted to expand the mill, and they had no way of doing it. They couldn't go into the water, so they had to start coming up onto the land, and there was just nowhere. The town had literally wrapped itself around the mill. And so the Great Exodus began. They um, There was a Chinatown as part of this village. Uh, of course, there was a lot of rather uh, <laughs> not awesomely treated um, uh, immigrants who were also, of course, part of the, the, the mill culture and the mill workforce. Uh, there was a Chinatown um, out off to the side of town. And, and then they had the rest of the town as well, the homes, the school, the shops, uh, all these sorts of things. And so the company was saying, hey, we're going to move you all. And that's exactly what they did. Um, over the course of the next four or five years, they built from scratch an entirely new town about six kilometers away around the corner out of sight of the mill on a place called Rumble Beach. And that is where the current village of Port Alice sits today. Everything in town, <laughs> with the exception of people building homes, is from the 1960s. Uh, the townhomes, the apartment buildings, um, the mall, the arena, the the um, golf club, everything is all built in the 60s because the mill built them all. And then they slowly started moving the people out. Once everyone was gone, they flattened everything. The only thing they left, I said the golf club, I didn't mean that. Uh, I meant the... Um, the uh, library community center kind of thing. They, they just built all new for everybody up there. The golf club was the only thing left. The golf club and the graveyard were the only things they left behind. Um, and the golf club, bless their hearts. I love it. It's uh, I don't play golf, but I would imagine playing on the side of a mountain would be quite entertaining. I think it would bring a whole new challenge to your golf game. But hey, what do I know? Like I said, I don't play golf. Um, so there we have this town uh, that has now completely reinvented itself, still 100% dependent on that pulp mill. There is nothing else. Trees are it. And this is the way it went. Through the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s, up and down, up and down. If the mill was doing great, everyone was doing great. If the mill wasn't doing well, well, then everybody suffered. Eventually, as I said, foreign investors came in, bought the mill, opened it up, and then just sort of left. And they left the town in a bad state. They left owing over a million dollars. I think it was $1.5 million in 
back taxes that, of course, the town was relying on. This really was the only industry in town. Um, and all of a sudden, the town is in a, in a really awful position. A lot of people just left. Um, homes got sold for next to nothing. Uh, and it was not looking good for Port Alice as a place to be. Um, with so many people gone, there was a lot of empty homes. A lot of things began to shut down. They had to uh, shutter the arena for right now. They can't afford to run it. Uh, the one and only full-service bank in town pulled out. Um, so it wasn't looking good at all. And uh, once it was sort of understood that the mill was now going to be dismantled, it was even more of a shock because that was not something people were expecting. But that's what started to happen. We were quite surprised. We've been going up there a little bit the last year because it's on the island here and we can go up there safely. And when we drove by it, we went up specifically to record this for you guys. And when we drove by the mill, it was like, oh my goodness, they've started to tear it down. They're planning on recycling 95% of it. Everything they can recycle, they are. So that's really cool. Um, there's so much metal and, and, and so much steel and so much copper and all those good things. So everything they can recycle, they're going to do it. But if you watch the video on YouTube, which we shot, you can see which parts are from the 1900s, uh, 1917. Um, there's a large cement structure, and that really was the start of it. Um, and that's still there. It was still, they just built around it. They tacked things onto it. Uh, they just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now here it is. Uh, just kind of sitting there. It's a tough place to be. It's a tough thing to watch. It's hard to see the town go through that. There was so much promise, so much hope, and it just all went away. Um, and and that's been really hard on, on everyone who lives there. They're coming out of it, no, though, now. It's really kind of cool to see. A lot more people like us are coming in, doing the Airbnb thing, um, they're really looking to make Port Alice into a kayak destination. It's always super busy in the summer anyway, um, simply because of all the saltwater fishing that goes out of there. A lot of sports fishermen. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, our Airbnb is booked, 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 booked. We thought we were buying a summer getaway. Nope. Apparently we were buying a more fall and winter getaway. Uh, because I don't think we're going to be able to get in there until September. So, hey, that's great. I mean, that's awesome. And I'm thrilled for the town because it means a boost to the economy. Um, but it is, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a surprise that it's going so quickly and so so fast. It's, it's getting, um, you're finding its feet again. It's awesome. But it's been a very hard thing for the whole town to uh, let go of it mentally, emotionally, that the mill is no longer going to be the place that's going to sustain them and support them. And they're having to look to the outside to find something new. That being said, um, we have been lucky enough to make some really cool friends up there. And uh, even though we're not up there as much as we like, and we were lucky enough to find someone who would talk to us who did work at the mill. Uh, he's gone pretty public with it, but the agreement I had with him was that um, we would call him the former employee, so that's what we're going to do. And uh, and I want to thank him because uh, his stories are amazing. I'm Now that he's shared his stories, people have been reaching out and uh, saying, yeah, me too. So that's been really cool, and I think it's been good for him as well. Um, there's always going to be people who say, what? I never experienced anything, therefore it must not be true. Yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> so, but um, it's been it's been really cool to hear the stories. And um, I think I mentioned before, this is not the kind of place where we went up there going, "Ooh, there's a haunted mill." No, no, this is the kind of place we got up there. I think it was our first weekend. We drove up the road down past the mill, and I remember saying to Jay, even as we were driving past the mill, "Oh, there's some stories here." There is some heavy spiritual stuff going on here. You could feel it. It was it was soaked in it, and uh, turns out I was right. So we're we're pretty lucky that we were able to find the stories we did. So without further ado, let's jump into a few of the ghost stories from the Port Alice Mill. Night in 
Port Alice. We are right by the uh, pulp mill that we've been learning about uh, all this time. We're standing near a waterfall. You can probably hear that in the background and probably stupid birds. Um, it's been really interesting. Uh, it's interesting uh, on a lot of levels because when we got here, we discovered that after uh, sitting with uncertainty for quite a while, they're actually pulling the mill down. Um, they've hired a company, they're coming in, they're, they're taking it apart piece by piece. So this mill, which has been here since 1910, is finally coming to an end. Um, when you ask around about the mill, if you bring up, you know, ghosts or paranormal, people will give you the look uh, and even say, oh, there's definitely something going on there. But not many people are willing to give you any details. But we were lucky enough to find one former employee who actually would give us some details and uh he gave some pretty good stories didn't he yes he did um now out of all the stories that he told do you have a favorite one or were you just sort of like wow that's crazy on all of them um i think they were all pretty f out there um i definitely like the lady in the gossamer dress he, he was very clear about a lady floating in a gossamer dress and that, that one pretty much stuck out to me, yes. I think, too, that he had a bit of a theory around that, too. I thought that was sort of interesting as well. Um, so we'll talk about that. But so, yeah, the, the former employee who we agreed to name, former employee, um, told us a few things. He had a number of things happen to him. He certainly was not the only one. He actually told us about how they would bring uh, guys in to do work on the mill because, of course, it was always falling down given that it was built all around the original infrastructure from 1910 and a lot of these guys would be there an hour and then they would just leave and and refuse to come back because of something they'd seen or something they'd experienced um some guys just left their tools and never came back like it was it was pretty intense so it was a very intense place for uh, paranormal activity which makes sense i mean there wasn't a whole lot in terms of workplace safety for the first few years at least um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people would have, would have ended up passing away in there, um, just as a day-to-day -day life. One of the things he, uh, one of the stories he told us, the, the first one he told us about was he was, uh, walking around, uh, the mill and he was following a guy and he could see the guy in front of him just in coveralls. And, uh, he was quite close to him, uh, really close to him. And the guy turned a corner and our friend turned the corner and the guy just wasn't there. He was gone. It's completely um, disappeared. Um, there was another one where he was actually touched, and uh, Jason's going to tell us that one. Yeah, so as this former employee was just about to start shift, he was just waiting around the waiting room and uh, leaned back a bit uh, near the uh, oil barrel and, and leaned back, and he started getting touched on the shoulder almost pushed a bit and he immediately jumped up looked around no one was there so he leaned back again and then he got over the left shoulder again kind of being pushed around so he was wondering if it was the guy in the the overalls that was about 10 12 feet in front of him turned the corner and just vanished uh, it, that's interesting. Yeah, and I mean, at that point he decided to go and wait somewhere else for his ship to start um he uh, was working a number of times, uh, often by himself, in different parts of the mill, and he would see a man glide by, uh, not walking. He, he would glide by, not paying any attention to him, uh, not even looking his way. This figure was just going about its business and, and gliding on. The one that he said, though, that seemed to come back... Um, not just for him. He actually talked to another guy who'd, who'd seen this figure. It was a woman, uh, the figure of a woman. He was standing in the mill. He was by a large heating pipe and it was blocking the view from the sort of the, the neck up. And uh, he turned towards the heating pipe and he saw just on the other side, the figure of a woman, uh, in a shimmering gossamer dress. And she sort of like, hovered there and and he said when he saw her he wasn't scared um in fact he thought she was beautiful but he he didn't he didn't know what was happening he wanted to know what was happening he was he said he hoped it would last a long time so he could figure out what was going on and then about three to four seconds later she just started to fade when he uh brought this up um he discovered that his boss 
uh, had also seen her, uh, seen her shimmering, but he saw all of her. And, uh, and she was upstairs uh, in, in the executive offices when he saw her, and it, it kind of freaked him out. And he had this, this kind of interesting theory, which I thought was actually pretty smart. He said, you know, they had furnaces there um, that they would use to heat up the boilers. And he said those furnaces, you know, well over 400, 500 degrees. And if you wanted to get rid of something, oh, I don't know, like the body of a woman you might have murdered, um, those furnaces would have been a good place to do it. So maybe that's why she's there. Because women just weren't in the pulp mill. That just wasn't somewhere they were, especially not in fancy silver evening wear, I might add. Um, the town was right there. It used to be, as we talked about in the history section, it was right beside um, the pulp mill. It was just integrated. It was wrapped around. We have a great picture we're using for the uh, for the episode picture uh and it's you can see that how close it was to where everybody lived if you want to see more pictures because we shot a video which we were putting up on youtube but if you want to see some more pictures uh jay used the drone and and we both took some um, pictures from around the town from around the mill you can go to our buy me a coffee page and if you are a, a five dollar member and up then you get to see all those uh windows into the episode uh for for the back pictures so, yeah, uh, the other thing that was there, you, you might remember from uh, my experience in episode one in Helm Canale, um, that energy uh, saying my name in my ear. Most of the time he would cough in people's ear. Similar story. Um, a lot of guys experienced uh, working alone in the mill, walking along, and then all of a sudden somebody would whistle in their ear. They would hear someone whistle a tune and, of course, turn, and there'd be no one there. So... This is one of those kind of backward stories because the reason that uh, I was even interested is the very first night we were in town. Do you remember this? We drove out here. Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah, I sure did. And both of us, as we drove past that big abandoned mill, were like, oh, this is creepy. There's something really creepy here. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, we were. We just uh, bought a place up here and... We were exploring the town, and, and some of the townspeople on the Facebook page suggested checking past and just going down the dirt roads, and that's when we encountered the mill. And it's it just doesn't have a good aura about it. It definitely has some... I don't know. It's it's a bit sad. There's there's sad feelings here, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think it was kind of a boom and bust town sort of situation. Um it's now being dismantled so we're a little surprised that about the third of the mill seems to be already torn down on the far end yeah i mean it's coming down pretty fast isn't it yeah and you you just get the sense that it's not still the energy around this place isn't still not at all and i i i truly believe that they could flatten that entire superstructure and they probably will uh they could set fire to the ground uh, but you know what that energy is still going to be out here no matter what yeah i agree um you it's a unique situation but right across the mill across the parking lot is uh is a little graveyard and we paid visit to that today so that was kind of interesting that's where i sent up my small drone to get some nice aerial shots yeah we got some pretty cool pictures of that place of the graveyard itself and of the mill from the graveyard yeah and it felt peaceful uh in the graveyard uh which surprised me because the mill doesn't and it really is across the street and across a, a big tank um so in that respect it, it was you know calming there um and next to that is a golf course which is it's an interesting little <laughs> golf course the golf course it's the only one i've ever seen on the side of a mountain so you actually have to play uphill but hey port Alice golf club you know you could you two could be a member um so yeah like i was saying this is one of those weird places because usually i will hear about a ghost story and i want to go and see the place this was backwards. This was the kind of place where Jay and I both came out here. We both had weird feelings. And then we found out there were ghost stories. We actually had one really odd thing happen to us one night when we came out here. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, 100%. We, were, we were driving along, and uh, Jay was driving. And um, we're coming just into sort of the mill property. And that's when... The door's locked. 
the doors locked and we were both like i said to jam like <laughs> like i kind of laughed and i said why did you lock the doors and jay said uh i didn't lock the doors i thought you locked the doors and i looked at him and he looked at me and we decided to keep going and so we came down past the mill and then we turned around and and we parked for a little bit i think just at the outside and then we uh began to head back and at the exact same place the doors unlocked all by themselves and we were both watching each other's hands pretty closely <laughs> in that point but the doors unlocked by themselves so we we're kind of like okay well something was either protecting us or wanting us to just stay in the car i don't know which it was but it was pretty interesting so that's really i mean that's our only weird thing that's happened to us here other than those huge feelings of energy coming off of the the building and and the structure itself but it's a pretty neat place, and I have to tell you, the whole surrounding area up here in Neurotsis Inlet is stunning. And uh, if you ever need a getaway, uh, Port Alice is the place to be. And oh, by the way, we might have a place for you to stay. <laughs> Thank you, Airbnb. Uh, anyway, um, that's it from Port Alice. We're going to be heading back. Uh, I, we're doing some more conversational story times uh, this week for other episodes but uh this is gonna wrap up episode three and uh, again um it, we'd love your support it's not free to do what we do so buy me a coffee.com backslash ghosts and bears uh and we would love to have your support there other than that thanks so much for me in and thank you for me jason and i hope you have a great rest of your night And that was Port Alice. And uh, thank you for going along with us and uh, seeing what it was like and experiencing the, just the, I don't know, otherworldliness of it. It's, it's a pretty special place. As far as nature goes, it's stunning. I mean, it's got um, a few incredible natural features you can't find anywhere else. Uh, being up there on an inlet or a fjord, as they're called in other parts of the world, is also pretty special. The humpback whales come through there. The killer whales come through there. Uh, of course, countless otters and seals and all those things. And seeing the bald eagles just, you know, hanging out, flying around, eating fish, doing their thing um, is pretty great. We do see lots of bears there, too. Um, not the other kind, the real kind. Uh, and that's really neat. I love seeing that. And uh, my goal is to see a moose, which I know isn't going to happen on Vancouver Island. But hopefully when we can start traveling a little more, I'll get to see a moose in the wild. I know. Stay tuned for Ian's cougar talk. You know, I'm just kidding. Uh, cougar I do not want to see because if you see a cougar, it's probably too late for you. You don't see them coming. So, uh, yeah, if you see a cougar, nah, you know, you're kind of done. I did do some research on that, though, and it turns out what you can get are these things called cougar hats. <laughs> and... They have eyes on the back of them, and apparently that freaks the cougar out, thinking you are watching them, and then they won't attack you. So, will I be betting my life on a pair of googly eyes? Uh, not so sure. We'll have to we'll have to look into that. For right now, we just carry what we call cougar bashing sticks. We'd never really hit an animal. Don't be silly, but. It makes us feel better. Uh, we picked them up at this place uh, in the middle of the island called Goats on the Roof. Well, it's actually called Coombs Country Market, and it is pretty cool. It has one of the best bakeries I've ever had. But everyone calls it Goats on the Roof because, would you like to guess with me? That's right. There are goats, and they are on the roof. So... That's why it's called that. Um, but it is on the way to Cathedral Grove, which is another amazing place here on Vancouver Island. So uh, in terms of things to go and look at and do and see and experience and immerse yourself in nature, yeah, we're pretty spoiled that way. So Port Alice is moving on. Um, there's no, no two ways about it. My question will be, what is going to happen to that energy that's there? Um, my guess, I think you could probably just you know burn the place to the ground and it's still going to have energy there um and as the town moves on i think in some ways the destruction of the mill 
is actually a really important piece of that because right now it's still there like a big old corpse and every time you go up that road you see it and you think about what could have been or what was and i think having it gone is going to provide a fresh start like i said they're embracing that fresh start already they're looking at tourism they're looking at um different ways to do things um there's a new coffee shop that's going to open up as i record this uh, this summer apparently um there's already a new hair salon there's a place with pizza which is i have to say some of the best pizza i've ever had in my whole life Yay, Crystal. She makes good pizza. Um, And the little grocery store that's there is awesome as well. So there's lots of really neat little things going on there. And um, I think it just needs a chance. It needs some tourism love. And the people who have been there long term are certainly open to it because they know there's really no other choice and there's nothing else. But they're open to it and they're positive about it. And um, there's also a lot of new people who are retiring there or finding less expensive ways to live because, of course, now with COVID happening, you can you can telecommute from wherever for a lot of people, and that's starting to happen there as well. So it's a pretty neat thing to uh, kind of be on the on the ground floor of and, and be a part of, and and it's it's just a great place to be. I'd like to thank everyone who helped us out with that episode, and you know who you are, former employee and former employee's wife. We are very grateful to you both. Um, You have really helped us out, and hopefully in telling the story, um, it's going to uh, help out as well, because I think there's some really good good things going on there, and uh, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, We also want to... Thank everybody who uh, has been supporting us, um, all, all you coffee buyers. Um, we got some new ones uh, this this past couple weeks. And of course, we are super grateful for them. Um, the ones who recently, most recently joined us, I'd like to welcome Penn, Claire, Lauren, Catherine, Michelle, Spandex Guy, great name haunted history our friends with haunted history bc uh betsy samuel and greg and i want to thank all of them for helping us out and uh hanging out with us and supporting us in what we do we've been talking about it actually jason and i am and we would really like to be able to come and uh, uh travel and see people where they're at and hear their stories with their history um that's something that I really want to do with this podcast is, um, you know, at the end of it, I always say, and, you know, maybe one day that place will be with you. And and we mean that. Like, we love traveling. Like, we have done some epic road trips because we just both love it. And um, we are very excited to get out and meet people and come and see you and spend some time in, in your neighborhood. Um, if you've got stories and you've got some history with it, that's what we want to hear. The hard part's getting the history. So if you can do that um, and share that with us, we would love, love, love to come and see you and record on site and uh, and get you on on the podcast and uh, just keep growing that community. That's what it's all about. Uh, that's what we want to do. Remember to check out the uh, free uh, YouTube videos. Uh, I made one of a drive through of the town of Port Alice and of the mill. They're all going to be a bit different because each location is a bit different, to be honest. Some things are going to work better than others. Um, I will get better at doing the videos. I recently just bought some video editing software. I finally <laughs> broke down and bought some because... Yeah, they just weren't very good, (laughs) and I recognize that. So um, they're going to get better. But in the meantime, enjoy them and uh, subscribe to the channel so you know when new ones come up. This one I put up about four or five days before the release of this episode, mostly so you can see what we're talking about. I think that's really important with these kind of stories is if I'm going to go there and tell you the story and and Jason's going to go there, then we want to be able to share with you where we are in that location. And so this is a really great way to do that. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind. And again, for our Buy Me A Coffee listeners, bless your hearts. uh, You do get the more extensive window on the episode with pictures and things like that. Uh, This particular time, Jason has some amazing drone pictures 
um, that are going to be part of your uh, buy me a coffee package. So thank you for for that and do enjoy those. Um, and again, thank you for everyone who's supporting our show. Uh, do keep in mind, the more you share it, the more you talk about it, the more you review it. Um, the more likely it is other people are going to uh, see it and jump on board as well. And we can keep doing this and keep growing that community. Cause that's, again, like I said, that's really what it's all about. So it's been really, really, really fun doing this so far. I want you to know that I've just been having a blast and Jason has too. And we're always talking excitedly about our next episode. And I, I have to confess, we have enough material now. We're all the way up to episode seven. <laughs> I know episode three is just coming out, but we have enough recorded material um, for up to episode seven. And I have other people going, so when are you coming to talk to me? Because I previously talked to them about wanting to come in and talk about their story. And I promise you, we will get to you. We are going to make it happen. I honestly thought it would just be like me digging stories out of my book. But once this thing took off, holy cats, this thing has just been growing its own legs and running down the road. And I'm doing everything I can to try and catch it. Like, run, forest. So, yeah, um, that's kind of how I feel <laughs> right now. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting. It's fun. Uh, so, please do check that out. Our next episode that's going to be coming up is going to be talking with, uh, her, her name is Dawn. Uh, Dawn has her own uh, group here that uh, had a little different take on on the whole paranormal thing. Um, they go and help people out if there's something going on in their home or whatever, and that's all free, of course. Um, they don't charge money for that to help people, nor do they charge money to help spirits because she is um, a rescue medium. So if something's in distress, then Dawn will wait in there and, and help whatever it is, try and find where it needs to go. But um, what she does do is she puts on these really cool events. So she'll rent an entire hotel and then sell tickets to the event. And you can go and spend the weekend there with her and her team and do all these kind of fun things. So it's pretty neat. And she's going to be our guest on episode four. We're going to be talking uh, about Agnes Bings, uh, who was very tragically murdered Um well, quite some time ago, 1800s, uh, but uh, her murderer was never found. And I have the story that we tell on our ghost walk. I went down there, got into a fight with a crow and a seagull who were fighting with each other. Um, but also Dawn has her own take on this story, which is really interesting. Um, she kind of, you know, shuts down some of my theories, but that's okay. Um, and uh, I think you'll be really intrigued to hear her story. Plus, she's from England. And does it get much better than an accent? Oh, I didn't think so. Let's see what I did there. Uh, so thank you for joining us again. Thank you for uh, coming along. And uh, again, thank you. It's just been great. And I'm really enjoying this. And you have any feedback, send it to me. Send it to us. Um, you can either send us an email at ghosts n bears at gmail.com that's g-h-o-s-t-s-n-b-e-a-r-s at gmail.com you can find us on our website ghostsandbears.com uh and of course facebook and instagram we're there as well so feel free to reach out feel free to let us know what you think and uh and give us feedback and in the meantime uh please do the reviews do the ratings do all those good things because that literally is the only way we're going to be able to um, spread the word of the podcast. On June 28th, the last place I can possibly put this podcast becomes available to me, and that is on the iHeartRadio network, and they won't take you until you're two months old. So that's what we're waiting for is, is that magical date of June 28th. Um, and then that'll be it. It'll be everywhere it can be, and I will have planted it in all the soil I can and given it all the water I can and well, the rest is up to you, my friends. So if you want this baby to go, we're going to have to make it go together. So thanks for being part of this community. Again, thanks for joining us. Have a fantastic week, day, whatever it happens to be you are in the middle of. Uh, and next time you're wandering around, remember, we've got the actual ghost stories with the actual history in the actual place. And one day, hopefully, that place will be with you. Take care. Bye. Bye.